So Denise Villeneuve's Dune. Uh, this is a film I've been looking forward to for quite some time. Um, I've been quite a fan of uh, Frank Herbert's novel and really the only director who I would trust with adapting this uh, this this fairly dense book into a film would would be Denise Villeneuve. Uh, his filmography includes stuff like Blade Runner 2049, um, Arrival. Um, he's also done a lot of like crime pictures like uh, Prisoners and Sicario and also a lot more surreal stuff like Enemies and like basically mostly just because of like Arrival and Blade Runner 2049. I knew that he would be the one that you would want to put on Dune. He would understand the darkness of it, the atmosphere that you have to evoke um, to make it like a very moody fantasy epic, which is what you want out of it. Now, like this isn't this hasn't been the first time that there's been like an adaptation of Dune. Um, obviously, you know, there's been that big documentary on uh, Jardawaski's version where he basically had like a pre-production book that was this big, pretty much like way thicker than the novel. Um, he had like big plans for it. Like they were going to have, I, I believe they were going to have Mick Jagger in the cast. They were going to have Orson Welles play the Baron. They were going to have Pink Floyd do the soundtrack, but it, it didn't quite take. And then in the 1980s, you had David Lynch do the, um, actually make that film, like the, the 1984 version that most people know. And it, Lynch basically hates it. Like it gets, it gets a lot of parts that I like from the book, right? But there's, there's, Certain there's certain parts that you know they trim up or they kind of like shift around and it kind of looks a little bit odd. Um, also, if you've watched the director's cut, it's heavy on exposition. It is so heavy. Like the director's cut, there's a whole like 20 minute prologue just to explain everything. Like oh, uh, like this is the Space and Guild. This is Caladan. This is Arrakis. Uh, these are the Fremen. Um, th this is the uh, th this is the jihad that led to everything that happened with Ar on Arrakis. And thankfully, with Villeneuve's version, uh, Villeneuve doesn't like waste a lot of time with exposition. Um, and I think that's kind of like a common thing you can see, um, in, especially in Blade Runner 2049. And in, in his version of Blade Runner, he lets um, he lets his film breathe. He lets you take in the environment and the atmosphere without explaining too much. Now, for a lot of people who aren't that familiar with the novel, that's kind of going to be a hindrance for this version of the film. Because uh, this film will not slow down to explain that much about the Spacing Guild, the Harkonnens, um, why there's this political battle going on for the planet. Uh, but it does, at least from like the way that it's presented in the film, I feel like it does a good job getting across the key points that you need to know. Like I like the fact that the film starts with a narration by Chani. On uh, on Arrakis, it it basically tells you everything that you need to know about Arrakis. You know they're you know the people who live there are the Fremen. It's a desert planet. Um, all the other planets come to it because they want this spice that can that can like transcend time and space and allow for like space travel to happen. So it's the most valuable resource in the in the known universe. So there's basically like a war going on for resources. So the Harkonnens have been mining this planet for spice production, and now they're being kicked off by the Spacing Guild, and the royalty of Caladan is going to come in. Now, Caladan is much different from the Ar The Arconans are very, like, war-hungry. Uh, they're, they're evil, they're sinister, like the evil Baron Vladimir Var uh, Harkonnen is obsessed with trying to, like, maintain his order and his age. And Caladan is kind of like this more more kind of like regal presentation of like royalty that they intend to like go into Arrakis and and basically harness like their basically what they call desert power essentially they want to they, they want to gain the trust of Arrakis and of course once they're sent there however the Harkonnens are working alongside the Spacing Guild um to basically sabotage uh the, the um the the House of Atreides from Caladan so basically like I mean, like, the, the plot, it seems really dense, but it can essentially be boiled down to the fact that it's kind of essentially like Dances with Wolves. You have, like, these outsiders come in to this, to this different planet um, to mine their resources, but then one person learns the way of its people and then sides with the natives um, to conquer against the colonizing invaders. Pretty common, pretty easy to understand story. It's just all the other stuff that can make it a little bit more dense like trying to understand the the witches of the Bene Gesserit and the um the the kind of the odd powers of the mentats 
and how Baron Harkonnen can like float and and has like this weird obsession. So there's all these little aspects that I love that are are thankfully kept weird enough. And I like the fact that um that it it maintains a lot of like the darkness. It seems like it, this kind of material could easily because it's meant to be like a fantasy epic you could easily see some producer coming in saying well you got to make this a little bit more funnier you got to like punch it up a little bit more and Villeneuve has this ability to make stuff that feels dark and moody but also like big and grand um and that's really what I love about because like Villeneuve like he he co-wrote the script as well and he has enough faith in the audience to that that they'll they'll take in like the visuals and be able to like keep up um, with everything that's going on in this story. Because there's, like, a lot of lore. There's a lot of, like, terminology thrown around. Like, um, like the, 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 the Gom Jabbar scene. There's a scene where Paul Atreides, played by Timothy Chalmay, who does a pretty pretty good job. Like, he's he has to be very subtle and a little bit very subdued. But there's a few breakout moments for him that I thought were pretty cool. Um, there's a scene early on where the Bene Gesserits are testing him, where he has to place his box in um in a box that will cause him excruciating pain and if he pulls his hand out the Bene Gesserit will kill him because he's holding like a poison um like a poison needle to his neck called the Gom Jabbar now the Gom Jabbar sequence um it's a fairly notable sequence from both like the 84 film and and this version of Dune like you've probably seen this scene from the promos that they're using to push it but the thing is like the Gom Jabbar scene is actually really early in the book like I believe it's the I believe it's like something like the second or third chapter in the book. It's very early on. And the film, of course, like pushes it a little bit further out so you can get some time to realize, okay, the Bene Gesserits are like these these witches who are kind of looking down on Paul because he's like the the son of a concubine and they only birth they only they essentially they want to birth women because they, they essentially rely on witches. And it's it's very strange and complicated, but it's kept perfectly strange enough where you're kind of like intrigued to learn more about it like i said there's a lot of terminology that they unload in this film like paul is said to be um this this messiah he's referred to as the um uh, the, the lead something by like the uh by the fremen and by the bene Gesserits, he's considered the quizat's hatteract it's essentially basically going to be a messiah like he's going to have this great power to control the universe and all that so there's like there's dense there's a lot of material going on in this script um but there's there's a decent balance to it i felt like they they lingered on a few scenes just long enough where it doesn't feel like Villeneuve is trying to make this plot too slow um and at the same time not trying to like leave out too much from the books like obviously there's there's quite a few subplots that are either cut out or reduced and we don't even see a bunch of of characters in this for those who don't know, this is the first part of the book. It's not the... It, for those who are hoping for, like, the full Dune novel, I'm, I'm kind of sorry to tell you, but this is only the first part. It even tells you in the title sequence that it, this is the first first half of the book. And it, 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 it essentially, if you've read the book, it cuts off at, like, just the right point where you can have, like, a big time jump. But, uh, but for... For like uh, almost like three hours and just focusing on half the book, it does get to quite a bit that I didn't think that they would they would cover. And of course, like I said, stuff has to be reduced. So like, you won't see the Emperor of the Space and Guild in this. You won't see Fade. So, um, which which doesn't a lot of people are saying like, well, where's Fade? It's like it doesn't make sense to show Fade now. He doesn't really do much in the f first part of the book. So there's a lot of characters who we probably won't see until the second part, so we'll hear about them later. Um, but for what we get in the first part, um, it's perfectly moody. We do cover, like, the the, the fall of the House Atreides on Arrakis. Um, th th I mean, there's there's so much to cover in this film. I guess we'll cover the cast. I mean, uh, like, Timothy Chalamet, I already mentioned, he, he's pretty good in the role. Rebecca Ferguson, as um, as the Lady Jessica, is really good in her role. She has, like, this... this this deep fear of, like, what Paul's becoming. Like, um, it always felt in Lynch's version, she was a bit more subdued. Like, she knew what was coming to Paul, but just kind of kept silent about it. Here, she's, like, racked with guilt about what's going to, like, come for her son. Because um, she partially knows what the Bene Gesserits have planned for him, but at the same time doesn't quite know what lies in his future for Arrakis. Um, Oscar Isaac does a, does a pretty good job as Duke Leto. Um, we don't get a lot of him in the film, but we do have a few interesting bonding moments that he does have with Paul. 
Uh, Baron, Bar uh, Baron Harkonnen is played by Stellan Sarsgaard. Um, he has, like, a handful of scenes, and they're, they're kept, like, perfectly grim. Like, you, you, whenever you see him, he's always in, like, a different state. He's either, like, you know, he, he's either nude and trying to, like, you know, get involved in, like, his de-aging process that has, like, the steam going on. Um, he's either dressed in, like, big robes that kind of, like, drape around the room when he, like, floats about, or he's bathing in just oil. And every time he speaks, there's always this, this reverberation, this booming sense to his voice. Uh, Josh Brolin plays Gurney, the 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 swordsmith. Per perfect for this role. Gurney is supposed to be this kind of like very easily grumpy and angered and agitated person who basically fears for Paul and is desperate for him to like learn some actual skills and try to like fear for his safety. And he has that perfect. He just he's so perfect for that role. Like the the. The quintessential scene where he confronts Paul with his training. He's incredibly angry with him. Just like, like I don't care that you're not ready. You're going to Arrakis. Uh, you're, you're probably going to face off against some people who will kill you. So this isn't a joke. And he, like, gets right up in his face. Like, to the point where he's just, like, spitting at him. <laughs> um, and that's, like, that's not even, like, half the cast that I've covered there. There is so many roles in this film. I mean, uh, Javier Bardem does a pretty good job as, as Stilgar. He has that perfect kind of, like, subdued, like, I don't trust you kind of look to him. The special effects, um, well, I mean, for starters, yeah, the, the special effects are better than, like, David Lynch's version. Because you could tell, like, there are some good-looking scenes in David Lynch's version, but then there are sequences that you can tell, like, the special effects were kind of, like, nearing the end of their budget. And they just didn't have, like, a clever way to display it. Like, the perfect example in the 84 um, Dune is there's the sequence where the um, where the Atreides are going to Arrakis. Where they have to basically use their ships to transport through space, uh, to, through space, through, like, this bizarre process of, like, you know, manipulating their ship to just appear at Arrakis. Now, the sequence leading up to that... Um, has all these weird light effects and like the the miniature look of like these giant ships um, locking together is really cool. But then their arrival at Arrakis is, is just the ship just fades in, like it, it's just like a simple fade effect. It's like there's all this build up, and then they get there. It's just like they're they're there. Thankfully, there there isn't a moment like that in uh, in Denise Phil News Dune. Um, the, the special effects, I mean, in, in this day and age, you, you, would, you would expect for, like, a big mainstream film like this for the special effects to look great. And, of course, they, they do. Um, the sequences where they have to engage with the, the body shields uh, is really cool. Like, you might remember in Lynch's version, they kind of have, like, this kind of blocky shape to them that looked a little odd. Here, they, they actually feel like, believe, like, you know, kind of, like, more modernized versions of, like, the shields where it's just kind of, like, this blue filament that covers them. And then, like, you know, when stuff tries to penetrate it, it kind of glows red a little bit. Neat little touches like that. Um, all the, the spaceships, which kind of take... It, it's weird because when you watch film, you can see a little bit of inspiration from various iterations of Dune. Like, if you look at the ships, you can see a little bit of what Jod uh, of what Jodorowsky was going for. Um, if you listen to, like, the score from Hans Zimmer, you can hear a little bit of, like, Toto's epicness spread throughout here and there, which is kind of cool. Um, and uh, the inspiration... Uh, like, like I said, the inspiration was for the music and the special effects and everything. But I also kind of liked how... Um, uh, how the music also has, like, kind of, like, takes its cue more from, like, the Middle Eastern inspirations. Like, you get, you can sense, like, a little bit more of, like, that kind of, like, adventure score that you would expect in, like, a globetrotting adventure, um, while still feeling very, like, you know, epic with, like, the, the, the orchestral score in there that works. And then, of course, I've got to mention, like, Jason Momoa does a, does a pretty good job. Like, um, he, he just has, like, that, that chipper, you know adventurous spirit to him which you want for kind of like a character like duncan who's willing to jump uh to jump head first into exploring the world of the fremen and arrakis although it was kind of funny when like the trailers were coming out and everyone saw jason momoa and they're like oh man i hope he kicks so much ass as duncan in this film and for people who have read the novel they're kind of like uh should we tell them about this uh, I, I won't spoil it here, but there's um, there's a little bit of a shock that comes with Duncan. Um, I will say that I did like kind of like the interesting use of like some of the characters who we do harp on a little bit more, even though they mostly have supporting roles, particularly um, Dr. Yui. I really liked like Dr. Yui, 
has like you can sense that there's a betrayal coming from him um and this was made very clear in like the books and lynch's version this was revealed early on that yui is not who he seems and he's not going to be um he's not going to be as loyal as you might think he is um but i like the fact that yui is kind of kept a little bit more aloof so that by the time that we get to the fall of the house of atreides um it's a little bit of a twist not not a big twist, but it's kind of like like oh okay, I could kind of understand how he was going through this and how it's a bit of a shock to come to the Atreides, um, because like I said with Villeneuve, he doesn't he doesn't overload the script with dialogue. Like that's I I guess like the biggest comparison you, you could find between Lynch's version and Villeneuve's version is that Lynch's version of Dune is heavy on the dialogue. When you read the book, there's a lot of inner monologues, a lot of a lot of prophesizing, a lot of exposition, and a lot of inner dialogue. Lynch's version keeps a lot of that dialogue, and Villeneuve's version doesn't. I, I like that the that it's more implied that there's something going on internally with these characters, um, as opposed to like just having like the whispering voiceover, which which I, I kind of found like a funny element of Lynch's version because every character would have that moment of inner voice where they would be like, you know, the spice extends life. Oh, the Fremen, we must trust them. Why am I whispering in my own head? That always bugged me a little bit. Why are they whispering in their own heads? Like, well, like I, I assume like maybe because they feel like maybe like one of the mentats or someone could sense them. Like, I got to keep it quiet while I'm talking about this. Um, so I, I kind of like that. I also like the fact that, you know, going back to like the inner monologue with the prophecies and stuff like that. Uh, the new film also does uh, have a lot of those moments. There's a, there's several scenes where Paul can witness like the future is kind of like you know a little bit of a preview for what we got coming up in the next film and possibly future films. Um, but I like the way that it's staged too, where like you know you can kind of like sense that Paul's being led along. Like you can hear like the raspy voice of the Bene Gesserit leading him along, saying that this is going to be his destiny, and then realizing that he can defy that destiny. And make it his own. Um, that get, getting back, getting a little bit back more to the special. I know I'm all over the place. That's just because there's so much to take in on this film, um, and I kind of love it for that. But the special effects with like the worms, I found was really great. Um, the sandworms, like, because you feel like that's the one thing everyone's going to gravitate towards. Everyone immediately, the, the iconography of it is you. You go looking for like the sandworms, and I love how like uh, restrained the sandworms are kept. Like the the first moment where you know you're going to see them is the moment when they attack the the the, sand, the the spice crawler. And that's a great scene. I love how the tension builds in that moment, because I kind of expected that moment to be one of the tenser ones. But I love how they kind of, like, don't make the worm, like, kind of, like, come up out of the ground, and you see, like, and you see, like, its whole body. You just see, like, the mouth come up and kind of, like, slowly kind of, like, f kind of come up as the sand kind of, like, descends into its mouth and all these thousand of like hundreds of teeth that just kind of like just slowly consume it and it's just it's brilliantly terrifying especially when you have the the Hans Zimmer soundtrack that kind of goes through like a little bit more of that kind of like ethereal type quality to it that makes it feel like both strange and weird and very frightening at the same time so there's there's so much I love about this film um I've you know I I saw it like two weeks ago at a press screening and I just saw it again this weekend at the Alamo Draft House. And it still holds up. Like, uh, like I really don't feel... Like, I guess, like, the most disappointing thing I can say is that it's not... I don't feel like it's Denise Villeneuve's best film. I feel like um, it doesn't... It, it feels like it's just exploring mostly what the book has and doesn't really um, envelop so much of, like, uh, so much of, like, something bigger that Villeneuve could add to it. Like, that's kind of, like, the best and worst thing you can say about it is that it's very adept at bringing a lot of stuff out of the book but at the same time it's just like well okay th this is everything that i wanted out of the book but i kind of i kind of would have liked to see just a little bit more of like what Villeneuve could could bring to it um that being said i, I can kind of understand like it's it's denser material so th there's a lot to take in here and a lot to adapt um so like e even for being like i think one of Villeneuve's weaker films I, st I still think it it holds up as a pretty pretty good as a pretty good adaptation it covers a lot of what i expected it to 
Um, it's very atmospheric, which is what I wanted it to feel like. Um, and isn't afraid to be very, very dark and and very um, and just just very grim at times because because it is. I mean, you read the story; it's it's very much a grim story. Like it's stooped in kind of a little bit of like a little bit of like Shakespearean dialogue here and there, and it's essentially a big fantasy epic. Um, but it's it's kept brilliantly moody, which I, I guess that that's another praise and damnation of it is that it's what I expect out of a Villeneuve, a Den Denise Villeneuve Dune film. So if you're familiar with Denise Villeneuve and you don't like his films, you're probably not going to like this version of Dune. But for what it is, I think this is probably the best iteration. When, when you consider David Lynch's version and the, the, the mini series that we got on the Sci-Fi Channel in 2000, this is by far the best version. It's got the best cast, it's got the best special effects, um, it showcases the most from the book while still having like a decent balance to it, and it just looks good. It's just it, it's just such a entrancing film. Um, and, and again, like another damnation I'll say is that because it's so adept, it's probably going to be a little bit confusing to those who have not read the book. Um, you might be able to keep up with it just cause like the, the film doesn't waste much time on it. Like if, if, if you can keep up with like the lore and the, the terminology they keep shooting out here, you'll eventually get used to it. You know, it, I, I would say if you're, if, if you can get ingrained in stuff like, like Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica pretty quick, where you don't have to look up all the terminology and all the stuff that it's relating to and the source material that it's drawing from, uh, you can get used to it pretty quick and, and you might even enjoy it too, but I mean, a lot of people are going to be fairly mixed on the film, but I, I enjoyed it. I love just being entranced in this world, just letting the score wash over you, just having uh, the booming soundtrack and the sounds of like the, the these odd-looking starships coming in and sandworms um, tracking you down where you have to like do weird walks to get around them. And just like all the um, the traditions of the Fremen and the prestige of the, the, uh, the House of Atreides and the and the, the cold nature of the Harkonnens, all that stuff that I love about the book is up on the screen. And as far as I'm concerned, that's that's just a damn good film. <laughs> so even for being Denise Villeneuve, like, I still feel like I like Blade Runner 49 more. I like Arrival more. Um, I even like uh, I even like uh, uh, Enemies a little bit more th than this film. But even for being one of Villeneuve's weaker films, it's, it's still a lot of fun. And I do feel like it's probably one of his more accessible films just because like like Blade Runner 2049 does have a lot of down moments it's a lot slower so it's a lot harder to get people into that Arrival is a lot more of a subversion of like the alien contact story so a lot of people might not grasp that angle but in terms of Dune it's it's a fantasy epic it's an adventure and at its core it's a fairly familiar story of like prophecies and messiahs that it's it's very accessible, and I like the fact that um, that it seems like a lot of people are actually going to see it this weekend. So, yeah. It's pretty much everything that I wanted out of a Dune film. I might have wanted a little bit more, but in terms of what's up on the screen, I really, really enjoyed it.